Now, don't get me wrong. I absolutely love burrs. And in fact, I've instructed you all to, you know, refer to me as the burr man. I spend a lot of my time researching burrs, tasting burrs, theorizing over what happens to burrs, making burrs. So today, we're gonna take a look at what is truly revolutionary in the grinding world and how we have just missed it completely, even though it's been around for millennia. Now I'm gonna take a moment and ask that you'd hit the like and the subscribe while we're here. Uh, if you've enjoyed my content past or if this is your first video, welcome. I'm Lance Hedrick and we do some um, crazy stuff on this channel, so buckle up. So in today's video, we're actually gonna do a grinder review, but it's not your typical grinder. It's not in line with what has been developing over the past seven, eight, nine decades. We're not gonna be looking at a, a grinder that houses burrs like this. Instead, we're gonna look at something that doesn't have a century of practice and of innovation behind it, but something with a few millennia of innovation. So let's walk back in time for a second. One of the first ones that we can see in history is what's called a saddle kern. And that is where you take essentially a flat piece of rock or one with a little bit of a curve in it. And you take something like a rolling pin and you're just kind of going at it, going at it in order to grind up spices. In the coffee world, kind of the innovation, the beginning was taking or borrowing the design of spice grinders. So for instance, one of the most iconic grinders in coffee is the EK-43. That was strictly used as a spice grinder until about 2007 or 2008 when Scott Rayo adopted it onto his bar in Montreal, Canada. I had done a consultant job at 49th Parallel in Vancouver and Vince, the owner of 49th, had a, an EK sitting in a corner. They never used it. It was just sitting there and I, I said, this looks like an interesting grinder. Can we, can we throw it on a bar and try it out? And my initial impressions were quite positive, so I decided to buy one. And now it's a coffee grinder. So there's a lot of overlap between grinding spices, grinding rice, grinding different things like that, and grinding coffee today. Well, from that saddle cairn, there was an evolution around the you know, other speculation, but around the 200, 300 BCE, uh, though we some of the earliest extents, at least in the at least in Japan and China, is around 59 BCE. But you, what you have are these rotary cairns that came out. Now, these were two cylindrical discs that were stacked on one another, not unlike our burrs today, but they were not made out of a tool steel or out of cast or anything like that. They were made out of stone. And so what they did is they would put these together and they would rotate the top one in order to grind up whatever spices or whatever they're putting through it in order to create a finer consistency. And so over the next two millennia, throughout Japan, throughout China, throughout Europe, throughout the world, there were evolutions of this. But what's interesting is over 2000 years, it didn't really change until the early 1900s to where we have these mechanical electronic things and we've completely changed everything. So we only have really 100 years under our belt with these new types of things. So today we're gonna go back to where it began because this is some of the best coffee I've ever experienced. So today we're reviewing the Weber Workshops SG1. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the only one in the entire world, the Weber Workshop Stone Grinder One. Now this is it, it's right here. $55,000, but completely worth it because this is gonna give me the cups I've been dreaming of since I was a little child. This one's a more evolved product. This isn't like those, you know, from the Yoyoi Dynasty back in like uh, 200 BCE. What we have here, first of all, you're gonna see on the sides, you're gonna see these little grooves. Now this is for your hands, so as you're rotating it, in order to grind, you'll be able to get a grip, right? And it also helps you lift it, because this is this is heavy. It's uh, 40 kilograms overall, about uh, over 80 pounds, almost 90 pounds of, of, of just bulk grinder. So it, this thing is never gonna need maintenance. It's never gonna go out on you. It's never gonna need sharpening. This thing is just based off of weight and off of the grooves that we're gonna go over in a moment. Now on the top, we have something really nice as well. We have kind of a grouted area, so it acts as a hopper. So this is similar to like modern day hoppers, but without all that plastic, okay? So we're able to get a nice flow of our beans into the hole right here, which is called the eye or the funnel. So we have the funnel up here where our coffee is being 
being fed down, just like in a hopper going into the chute, okay? There are differences around the world, some differences in how these were made. In Europe, you had what was called a rind that you would put inside and it could help you decide, dictate kind of your coarseness and fineness when you added a little peg to it. Um, in, in Eastern Asia, they didn't really have that, although you did see some instances over the years where people would, would use it mostly for creating of tofu, but we're gonna take a look on the inside because that's the exciting part. That's where we're gonna see the cuts, the grooves and all that. We gotta let the gun show rain, so you know, we can't have this on. It's holding me back. Y'all excited? Because I'm excited. Here we go. All right, so this is what we have going on here. Now, interestingly, we, there's, there were two essential patterns that really evolved over the, over the whole world when it came to these. Uh, and this is the, the majority one, the predominant one, which has eight quarters. Now I know eight is not a quarter, and they actually would say a quarter is not a quarter. It was a very weird thing. But in, in reality, there, there are eight. So uh, these quarters are like, are thusly. You have these lines, all right? There are eight lines going around, which gives us eight pieces of pie and these are called furrows. And then we have these secondary furrows, and these would generally you know, change depending on what you were kind of doing, where you were at around the world, but uh, what happens here is these help to funnel and push whatever you're grinding to the edges. So if you notice, this is a little bit concave, and, and the gap, the lacuna between this bottom, this bottom burr, this bottom uh, kern, and the top one, that lacuna, is called the bosom. So what it is, is you have this little concave piece, and you have this bosom that allows the infiltration of of the, of the beans right here, and you have this little groove here which allows for the spreading out of them as you are pushing it around. In order for the grounds of whatever they're making to fall out, they needed the bottom one to be sloped more. So a lot of them were cone like on the bottom. So cone burrs, even as we're finding out today, are a thing of the past, let's get rid of cones. They decided it makes more sense for it to be flat because it's not gravity that's allowing the ejection of these particles, it's actually centrifugal force. Now they didn't really use that terminology, but you know, that's what was going on and that's what they realized. So up top we have something sort of concave, which allows a slow feeding of the of the of the of the beans, which we're finding today is you know analogous to pre-breakers. So we have these pre-breakers that are breaking up the bits of coffee into bigger bits, and as it keeps traveling down these furrows and it's being crushed and tumbled by the furrows, it hits the outer circumference, which is where these burrs are essentially touching, and that's where it's giving it that fineness at the very end. Now on the inside we have what's called the pivot. Now normally this was made of some sort of iron or it was made out of wood. This one is is really nice, really unique. It's made out of wood. Uh, it's hand turned and it looks to be hand oiled. It's very nice, very good quality. So you put this in and it has little pieces of silicon tape, which is obviously not really part of the part of the era, but this is to really help with the friction there. So it's gonna stay put right there. Now this guides the top one onto the bottom. So as you spin, it's gonna stay on top of this and it's not just gonna float around. It's simplistic. You don't have to go through and resharpen anything. This is robust and you know, in the end you might need to regroove it, but it's very easy. You can do that with a lot of tools. So let's stop talking and let's start uh, tasting. So today, in order to show just how unimodal and perfectly ground this coffee is gonna be, I decided to use a really, really lightly roasted coffee. This is a washed Kenya from a Pollen's Gold out in Japan. Uh, very nice coffee, very lightly roasted, and this is just gonna tear right through it because of that 20 kilogram weight on top. You don't even have to worry about alignment because of the weight, it's perfectly aligned. You don't have to worry about revolutions per minute because you dictate it with your hands, okay? So there's a concentricity about this that you can't really attain with other grinders. The finishing teeth there are so perfectly uniform that as the particles are ejecting, they have a final shaping of rolling off that allows for a sweeter extraction. When you look at cast burrs, which is like the lab sweet burrs and the ditting, which we have some over here somewhere, but who cares about those nowadays? What the, the, uh, the theory behind it was the grooves, the ruggedness of the cast steel allowed for the rolling of particles to give you a sweeter brew, a more consistent sweeter brew. Well, this is a daggum rock. You don't get more porous than this. This is gonna, once these are seasoned, and you're gonna love it when it's seasoned. Once this is seasoned, it's rolling the particles out in such a way that gives you the sweetest, most delicious coffees you've ever tasted in your entire life. We're gonna brew a little a little head to head. I'm gonna get my uh, one of my uh, three, four thousand dollar grinders of this modern stuff. I'm gonna grind that and I'm gonna grind some of this. We're gonna have a brew off. This is a high retention grinder. Uh, so that's one of the downsides. But one of the good things is, boom, they send you this beautiful brush. Now this brush has horse hair right here and maybe a little plastic, who knows? Uh, and it's got a nice oak handle. Granted, this was not handmade by Weber. This was from Muji, but they were so kind to throw it in there with it. But this makes cleaning a breeze. And if you need to get a little of the retention out, you just open up the burrs, which is a good workout, and you just do a little scroopy scroop, okay? So I'm just gonna kinda like eyeball this. 
we're just gonna I'm gonna kind of eyeball how much I need that's probably more than enough it's good for me so all I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna you know I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna fill it so I don't really have to rely on the funneling process. But then all we do is you spin it counterclockwise. If you remember the groove there, that helps to spread out those particles amongst the furrows. That's what we're trying to go for. So we don't wanna do clockwise, we're gonna do counterclockwise. Now, a, a downside is because I have this small table in front of me, uh, the, this kind of sprays out all around. So RDT doesn't really help. I've kind of checked that out. It doesn't really help. That's just one of the downsides you're gonna have to live with. But with this, you can accumulate the grounds easy peasy. Some's gonna get on the ground, which, you know, grounds on the ground. It kind of makes sense. One, two, three. So we're grinding and look, some are being ejected now. We're starting to eject. It's starting to eject, eject the grounds. Look at that. Beautiful consistency. Absolutely gorgeous. I've not seen anything. Oh my God, this is so great. And what's great is if it's not fine enough for you, you don't have to mess around with a dial. You just put it back in and you grind again. Not a big deal. And you'll get a double workout. It's like CrossFit in the morning, okay? Rich Froning, eat your heart out, all right? I know he's into coffee. When's he gonna come out here and show me how to do pull-ups and then drink some coffee with me? I don't know. Wait, there's a little bit more coffee. We're gonna funnel it in manually because we like to be manual here. Oh, listen, do you smell that? Probably can't, but wow, it smells delicious. Okay, so I'm thinking I'm thinking now that we have this all ground up. I mean, look at this. Oh, wow, this is just, I've never seen anything like it. And listen, I have over 40 grinders currently in my possession. And uh, let me tell you, nothing is like this. The experience, the smell, the, the connection with, with, with history. I mean, goodness gracious, is there anything like that? I don't, I don't think so. What I'm gonna do is I think I want this a little finer, so I'm gonna grind it in through it one more time. And um, yeah, but let's see the retention here. See, it's not ideal, not ideal. But you know, when you're getting, when you're getting grounds like this, when you're getting such incredible coffee, you, can't, you, take the, you take the trade off, okay? So let's go ahead and get some of this out. I'm gonna leave a little in there just cause it's a little, you know, it's a nice little seasoning thing. Also this rock's getting quite heavy, but that just shows my weakness. That just shows that I'm not ready to grind with Rich Froning yet. Now in true Weber fashion, I've got my tumbler here and I'm just gonna, I'm gonna refill it and I'm gonna grind it one more time. Look at that. Oh, that's just, it doesn't get any better than that. So I'm just gonna feed it all back in there and we're gonna go one more time with it. And then we're gonna grind with, uh, with a nice uh, expensive grinder. Oh, and wow, it's much, there it is. That's the grind size I'm wanting. That's perfect for my V60 recipe. And sometimes if you're feeling feisty, you can try to do a full revolution with one turn, like that. Just, that's a trick I learned just now. It's a really good and helpful trick. It's gonna really, really help you. Uh, Cause you want, you know, we're kind of sitting around the 30, 40 RPM, but sometimes going up a bit, it helps eject it a bit faster. You don't have as much contact time with the burrs if you're seeing that it's already fine enough, so. I mean, I'm sorry to say, Doug, if you're watching this, this uh, this is about to put your EG1 out of business. All right, we have the one brewed with the SG1. I mean, look at that color. This one brewed about six seconds longer than the EG1 did. And then we have, you know, the EG1 with all the modern technology and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So there's that, just off to the side. All right, smells, well actually, let's start with this. Let's start with low expectations. You know, it's, it's good. You know, you have that, you know, you have some black berries, you got some, you know, actually it's more like, like ripe raspberry. It's good, it's not potent though. You got a little bit of lavender, you have some lilac, you've got some, maybe a little like milk chocolate. It's it's good, it's fine, it's solid. Decent mouth feel, but we're gonna taste, we're gonna taste 2,000 years of innovation right here. 2,000, not 100, 2,000. First off, the aroma, it's like, it's like,
thank you so much. This coffee's delicious. It's so good. It's so good. Wow. This is um, mind-blowing stuff here. Oh my goodness. We actually have some cantaloupe kind of coming out, some melons coming out, but that that raspberry is much more potent. It's more punchy. It's more uh, caressing. We have like a velvety, silky chocolate that's just coating my tongue. We have this uh, this vibrant florality. It's somehow, it's a contradiction in terms in the sense that you're able to get all of these flavor notes, but to extremes. Normally you have to give a little trade off here or there. Not, not with the SG-1. Okay. Thank goodness because I took out a second mortgage on my home to buy this, but good grief. That is just... That is something else. That is something else. Ugo, you need to come try this. You were a little bit biased, you know? No, no it way. Sh it should be a, a I do all my testing off camera. This is just a reflection of reality. Wow, I prefer this one. Well, there you have it, folks. The one and only SG-1 crushing a $4,000 grinder and not even with batting an eye. I mean, it makes sense though. Like, why would we take the last 100 years of innovation, over 2,000 years of constantly improving and evolving a product. We have these, so let's have them, right? And, and it's just so nice that we have someone with an engineering degree from Stanford at, and then Doug Weber to come through and, 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 and just rediscover this, rediscover these stones in his backyard in Japan and, 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 and create something so magnificent. Now, if I did have one con of this design, it didn't come with a nice thick base. I need a nice thick base for this, so I'm using some rubber and a rag underneath because I don't want to scratch up my table. Granted, it would be worth it for this, but let's be real, there are cons here. And the retention, it's a little ridiculous. So we need to figure out a way to eject it a little bit better, maybe have a little cleaner grooves. That's about it for me today. Um, so I'm going to sit here, I'm going to, you know, not have that one and I'm gonna I'm gonna chug this uh, it's absolutely fantastic and I just um, you know I'm I, I'm gonna be passing this on um, hopefully uh, there's a buyer somewhere because honestly uh, even though I do think it's worth 55,000 I don't have that money I kind of need it back to reclaim my house but it is what it is but maybe there's someone out there who's gonna buy this from me and I kind of hope there is but you know it's still great it's great it's great so I hope that you enjoyed the review. Um, I hope I didn't give you too much FOMO on the next new grinder that's expensive. Um, Cause I'm, you know, I'm, I'm want to do that. But uh, yeah, I think that's about it. So I'm gonna leave you with a cheers and uh, I hope that you brew something tasty. This video is part of an elaborate ruse Doug Weber set up for an April Fool's joke in 2023. All historical information presented in this video is largely true, but anything I say about quality is fabricated, and my reaction to the bruise is a short drama. Doug sent me this free of charge to partake in the ruse. Although I wish this disclaimer was not necessary, I know I can unintentionally be quite convincing, so please don't skewer me. Kisses.